Demaris Whitaker is the senior minister at uh, Fort Washington Collegiate in New York, New York City, which is a little larger than where Tracy's from. But um, they're celebrating 102 years of service, if I understand correctly, um, the churches, I should say. Um, Reverend Whitaker, um, who's originally from Puerto Rico, uh, increased membership of 20 some odd percent over five years at her church in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and um, uh, we're, it moved to New York last year where she um, saw a 20% rise in membership in the past year. Uh, Damaris graciously carved out some time this evening from her vacation um, to share some of her experiences with us. And so thank you so much, uh, Damaris. Uh, if you could, uh, I already kind of highlighted what the results were, but if you could kind of briefly talk about what you saw as the challenges and some of the tactics and strategies you took, that would be great. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for having me. I am actually in spending some time in my house in Connecticut uh, this few weeks, this past few weeks. Uh, we just came back from Puerto Rico doing uh, some relief work, which we've been doing since uh, Hurricane Maria. So when I uh, began in our church in Hartford, I came in as a designated term pastor because the church had been in transition for quite a long time. Uh, they had an interim that was uh, three years uh, serving there. And then when they called a settled minister, he left within 11 months after being called. Uh, so it was a time of turmoil and uncertainty. And um, one of the first things that I did when I began at the church was to begin a series of one-on-ones. You know, I'm, I'm a community organizer, so that, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, it's community organizing one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> so I um, also did a, you know, we did uh, cottage meetings and congregational meetings when they were not scheduled to have congregational meetings. So that was a little bit of a change just to keep a process of transparency uh, open and uh, to just hear where the church wanted to go, although they had gone through a rigorous process of discernment before I got there. So I learned that uh, that particular congregation held very highly their history. Uh, they had uh, faithfulness that often was unhealthy to their endowments and their buildings. And I'm sure that that's not happened to any of you in any of your settings, where the buildings and endowments um, are leading the way and often the dead are leading us. Uh, so Hartford, Connecticut is a city that 77% um, of the people that live there are from somewhere else in the world. Yet uh, the oldest church in Hartford still had a majority of people who were, uh, who were white, not people of color, and spoke one language, while the city speaking various languages. Uh, we began also a process of trying to understand who was around us and did the church reflect the people that was around us. So we started by changing the worship style, not drastically, but just inserting elements of diversity, of multiculturalism, um, and different languages. And that was met with great, uh, it was welcomed by some and resisted by others, let's just say that. But what that taught us is that you cannot uh, wait until they come so that you can build it. You gotta build it so that they can come. And by us beginning to have a more diverse style of worship, more people of color and, and diverse groups of people came to the church. As a pastor, one of my disciplines was every Monday, I, I sat down in my office, because my, my Sabbath is on Fridays, and I wrote to every new person that came through the door. And sometimes I had to write 10 letters and sometimes I had to write one letter. But um, it was a, a discipline that yielded great results because 
you know, as you know, uh, you, we live in the age of technology. And so people don't write letters anymore. Um, I, for one, that, not, that's not a discipline that I had in my personal life uh, because I, you know, I have, I'm, in a, I'm in a bookstore and I have all my devices with me. Um, but um, I feel that you know, having that um, extra level of communication and, and follow up for new members yields great fruits for us. Uh, it also was a form of communication that the elder people, older people in our congregation could relate to uh, because that generation wrote letters. You know, my grandmother wrote me letters here in the United States and I wrote her letters because that's the only way that we could communicate. Um, so that was, I thought, you know, one practice that began to um, sort of bring down some some walls um, and move us in a different direction. The congregation knew that I cared about them, um, and so they began to trust me. I don't want to minimize some things that are important for us as leaders, uh, and it's the issue of gender and race. Uh, we cannot shy away from what it means to be the first person of color to lead a church that is 385 years, and to that, the first woman to lead it. So I had to fight some big dinosaurs, but I'm a tough broad, and I won many times. I lost some other times as well. So, um, Nonetheless, you know, one of the things that allowed us to grow significantly is that we open our doors not only for worship. You know, I remember when the Ferguson decision failed to happen um, on Michael Brown's death, we opened our church for a vigil. And Connecticut is not a very big state, so for those of you that come from more expanded spaces, you know, this may not sound like it's a long distance, but uh, having kids, you know, young people to come from Stores, Connecticut, which is about an hour and 10 minutes away from Hartford in the middle of winter from the University of Connecticut, as well as people from Bridgeport and New Haven to Hartford to a vigil, and they are to be met by the mayor of Hartford and other dignitaries. This was significant for Center Church because it had been a long time since that had happened. And opening our doors that night, um, and even before that, meant that this church was here for um, the, the, the community. And so um, that was just one of the many times, you know, Orlando, the massacre in Orlando happened. We were open not once but twice for a vigil uh, in the community. One in for everyone, including the the the, um, the lieutenant governor who came through the doors, but another one bilingual, a bilingual vigil that was requested by the Latino community, which surprised me. Um, to be honest, because we have many Latino churches in, that speak solely Spanish in the city of Hartford. And I was tired and exhausted, but I couldn't say no. And so there we went and did two vigils after the massacre in Orlando. And so from, from trainings to the ACLU to stand with your Muslim neighbors, in many controversial moments, we opened our doors and put our bodies on the line for social justice. And that gave a message to the city of Hartford um, that, you know, that the First Church of Christ, while it's still mostly white church, cared for all. And a lot of people came, um, and most of the members I joined in the last two years of me being there were people of color, um, of various backgrounds. Uh, we, we make the mistake of thinking that people of color are only the poor. But that's not so. So um, it was a diverse in economics, in backgrounds, in uh, education, and um, it, it, I I feel that God was with us at a time where we felt that a church 
was on the verge of probably heading toward a destination of closure and death after having two very catastrophic episodes in its history with ministers leaving abruptly. And together, uh, we turned it around to a place of vitality and growth. And it gave it a, it showed the community that that church who they often stood in front of it to take the bus was not a museum, which is what people used to say when I first started and said I was the minister of First Church of Christ. And they were like, oh, is that a museum? You know, that's, that was a question that used to bother me so much. Um, but, um, but, you know, we had, I, I want to be honest about challenges, right? Because it's, it's important that we know what they are. It, it, we, we don't just over, don't overlook them, right? So history is an asset and history can also be a challenge because there are people who don't want, they don't, they've sacrificed their present for the sake of the past. And we we're sacrificing the present all the time in the United Church of Christ for the sake of the past. And one of the t techniques, the strategies that I, that I employed was I learned everything I could learn about the history of the church. I was its, its, its 25th pastor and all the men behind me, um, some of them slave owners and you know, all of that, I did not. I didn't sugarcoat that reality to nobody. Um, but I, there were also pastors that were, re, that were real ministers, that were real urban ministers, that understood where to go to look for the marginalized. And I pulled their histories out, and I renamed some of their efforts to have the language that we use today. Um, when they welcomed the immigrants from Europe, um, I call that, you know, a model of empowerment and not charity. And I began to translate some of those actions into, into the language of today, giving it a new description and definition. And then that meant that people started understanding that what we were trying to do was not so new, and that brought, and that brought to them you know, some peace, in, <laughs> some peace that they were not losing their church. <laughs> To the Latino chick who just came in, um, so it uh, it just you know we I had to do a lot of massaging, but we also you know I, I think it's important to note that people do care about other people, and when we open our doors to serve the homeless or single women heads of households or employed a new program for security deposits, which is the biggest hurdle of any family to get an apartment in an urban setting, people understood that what we were trying to do was change lives. And when we turned around and asked those people, you know, we gave you security deposit, we need you to do 10 hours of volunteering here, and they would do it, the church understood that people want to be treated with dignity and respect. And it's not about a handout. They need to feel that they also are useful and they're serving. We in, the, in church, we do charity really, really well. What we don't do well is empowerment. We don't think people want to use their gifts. We don't recognize the agency of the poor. And so we continue to give and give and give and ask nothing in return. And I know that all of us need more volunteers in everything that we're doing. And I think that when we have programs, it's great that we ask people to give us back their talents and we will be surprised at how, how grateful they are to do it and how useful it is to our ministries. One of the um, other things that we, um, we worked on very diligently is that if we were going to really be a multicultural, multiracial church, people who are of color need to be in leadership positions. If we are really going to be an open and affirming church, which we were for 25 years, people who are gay and, and LGBTQ, transgender, needed to be in leadership positions. So we made sure that there was inclusion in the leadership always so that the message was not lost. And even then, once in a while, someone would say, you know, we really are a um, 
middle class white church. And I was always say, well, you see me sitting here. <laughs> you know, we, we don't always um, do well in acknowledging the other. And also hiring the right staff um, also helped us to, to send the message. Um, I want to also say that, you know, fear of death in our congregations is the most compelling argument to live. I, we were in a congregational meeting and I asked the, um, I asked the, con I, I proposed a motion. I, I presented a motion to the body without talking to the moderator, which, you know, then I had to apologize, but, um, and the motion was, I want to know um, if you want to live or die. And if you want to live, then that means that our change is going to bring some pain. But living is a decision. And we cannot live continuing to do things the way we do them because our data indicates that what we have been doing has not yielded any, any results of life. So whenever I was in a little bit of a bind in a new project, I would just remind people that we chose to live. And living means change. And how do we navigate that change? That's the question. The question is not, is the change going to happen? It's how do we navigate it? One of, one of um, the tools that I found useful was data. You know, we, to collect data of attendance, to collect data of demographics, to collect data of who's coming through the door, not necessarily on Sunday morning, but to our programs during the week, to our mass meetings on issues, to our vigils, to our protests, who, who is coming through the door. That, that data allows us to measure the vitality and also, I wanted to, um, to really begin to send this signal that vitality is measured by so much more than the numbers on the books, uh, by so much more than those people who we stay pledge an allegiance to be our, our members. In New York, as I've been there one year, we have, um, we have received over... 30 members this year, because every Sunday that we have communion, I, I took a page out of the, um, I took a page out of the Pentecostals. <laughs> and um, and um, we, I, I invite people who have been dating us, as I say, because people date in New York for a long time. That's something that I'm, that I'm trying to get used to. They, they need the church for four years and they give to the church, but they don't become members of the church. And I don't fully understand that. You know, I'm trying to understand that now. So I say, you know, if you, if you have been dating us for, uh, for a while, um, you know, come up and become a member and put a ring on it in the words of Beyonce and, uh, and commit your, yourself to us. So that's, that's what's happened in New York. And other than Puerto Rico, I want to share in a little bit in the chat section a video of our work in Puerto Rico because we don't have time to talk about it here. And I just want to pause to entertain some questions. Um, I think that one of the questions is, what kind of volunteer opportunities do you offer folks um, you work with? Um, I think for now, now at Fort Washington Collegiate Church, we have opportunities on organizing. Uh, we have opportunities, sometimes we offer immigration clinics, so we need people taking intakes of people who are coming in to take services. Often we have um, opportunities to uh, organize a march or to be able to clean an area of the neighborhood. Those are you know, those one-offs I find that are really helpful in urban settings where people don't have to be in committees forever, um, which is a, it's something that we have to restructure in some of our congregations. The committee model do not work, does not work anymore. And also opportunities during worship to be a liturgist, to be an, an usher and a greeter, to be able to, in the connect themselves to the rotation model of church school with the children. Um, and 
also an opportunity to lead. Like we're having a retreat in September and it's completely lay led. I just, I, I go there to just sort of help them plan, but they're the, the lay leaders and, and others who are not in leadership positions are putting it together. Um, people want to serve, they want to get also educated. So we use the second hour after worship as an opportunity to bring special speakers and to also provide people with opportunities to sign up and do something in the community. Um, did I lose any major givers with all those changes? <laughs> I did not. Because people don't want to live in church that's, that's living. I did not. I had conflicts <laughs> with people who were major givers and some of the people in my leadership were a little nervous and I would always say you know if we live we live to God and if we die we die to the Lord but whether we live or die we are God so we got to move forward um, I think that I, I had some very serious conflicts with uh, one of my major givers on an issue that had to do with construction around the church and the city of Hartford and our position in relation to that. And how I handled that was I canvassed my people. I used my community organizing skills and I got, I did my one-on-ones. I was able to, to hear people's arguments. I was able to, when, when I saw the situation getting worse, organize people around the issue. I asked the leadership to make decisions and I carry them out. I did not, um, I didn't, I didn't, it was not, it was not my finest moment in ministry, but I did not give up and give in to his influence of money. I, I used the people to make the decisions and it, when the people made the decisions, I carried them out. Um, I will say to you that there are moments there that I felt that I was going to crumble, but I didn't. And it's because at the end of the day, when I was asked about how I handled that, I said, I went and implemented the decisions of the council. The council voted, I enacted. And that cannot, a vote is a vote. And after we take a vote, we got to get on board. Um, the church was tense. I just want to answer the questions that I have here. The church was tense after some of that um, unraveled, especially the old time members thought that, you know, he would not come back. But again, people don't leave a church that's living. And when growth was, was overt and he could not be denied and vitality was there and you know, my op-eds in the Hartford Current were published and people were writing about the church. People don't leave a church that's living. And so it's just, I, I talk about it and I feel a little pain in my stomach. You know, you, you can relate to that. You know? <laughs> but but, um, but we, we, you know, the best tool we have is the people. The best tool we have is our council and our leadership. And if they are on board, then you just have to move forward. <laughs>